So, thank you guys for coming today. All of you, you're awesome. Um, what we're gonna be talking about today is kind of like how we use feedback throughout the course of a product uh, to make it better. And uh, that can be before the product launches and it can be after it launches as we iterate uh, in, as we're here, Agile Sprints. Uh, but before we start, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I run a company in New York City called Charming Robot and we are a product design studio. So we work with really large companies, helping them kind of strategize what it means to be a business on the internet, even if they've been a, around for 50 years or 100 years. So I've thought about like, what does it mean to be a media company in 2019 for like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and creating an experience that fits what their audience wants, but also what you know, they need to do for a business. Uh, we also work with smaller companies that are startups, things like um, Hulu, which is kind of a similar thing to Netflix in the, in the United States and Japan. Um, things like Foursquare, which was a big thing about 10 years ago, uh, and now it's probably a little less relevant. Um, and I also uh, I do a podcast called Story in a Bottle, which is about learning from people who are practitioners in the world of tech, in engineering, in user experience, and design. And why I mention that is that it's also something that is a product that we've been working on for about four years and are constantly you know, getting feedback for and, and hopefully making better uh, with each episode that we launch, which is it's about every Wednesday, give or take a few. Uh, depending on who we have kind of in the can. Uh, but definitely worth listening to if you want to learn more about kind of the product process and, and how, uh, how some great products are, are created. Um, one of the things that's going to be a little different about today as we talk about feedback is that you're actually going to be giving me feedback. So um, over the course of, and just feel free to pass these back to each other. Over the course of this um, workshop, I'm going to stop intermittently and ask you guys uh, what you may have written down on a card. So hopefully you have pens. If not, we can get you pens. Um, there's some on the table right here. And so if you have a piece of feedback for me, it could be, I don't like your shirt. It could be, I don't agree with you on this thing. It could be, you're talking too fast or you're talking too slow um, or whatever kind of feedback you want to give, um, positive or negative, it is welcome. Um, and I, I look forward to uh, picking on you and uh, listening to your feedback and hopefully applying it as we go. If, uh, if you don't like my shirt, I have one on underneath, I can change it, um, if that is your feedback. <laughs> I'm sure these guys will love if I do that with a mic, it'll make really good noises. Um, but I thought, like, when it comes to feedback, there's so many different kinds of feedback we give, right? And we get. We get feedback from our peers, from our clients, if we have clients, or our bosses. We get fe feedback from the audiences we develop for. We get feedback from our parents. We get feedback from all these people who sometimes we want it and sometimes we don't. So what I'm gonna do is break this up into different kind of stories of ways that feedback has in, can impact a project. Um, so we'll start, start with Hulu. Um, Hulu launched in the States in October of 2007. And my role on it was I, I, I led the um, strategy and user experience and design side of it. Um, someone else did the engineering, someone else figured out the business model. But my team and I kind of figured all out what, what does it mean at the time to watch long form video online, which back in 2007 was not something that existed. You had YouTube and that was about it. And so the background here is that NBC and Fox, two American TV networks, had the idea to create a site where you could go and watch TV. The thing was is that most of the tech media and most of the people in tech thought we were trying to create a YouTube killer. We weren't. We were trying to create something that allowed you to watch TV anywhere, anytime, anywhere, anyhow you wanted to which is different than watching short from video, meaning like it's a lean back experience as opposed to leaning in. During the whole process, we're not trying to get you to watch something else, we're trying to let you finish watching what you're watching and then maybe lead you to the next thing. But the challenge with this is that you had a lot of people working on this, this project that didn't know anything about the internet. You had NBC and Fox TV executives who know TV but don't know uh, your experience design, don't know visual design, don't understand how people think about the internet. And so you get a lot of bad ideas. We got a lot of bad ideas. And during the course of the process, we kind of, I think we made about 150 or 180 wireframes with things like friend casting, which is appointment based viewing for TV shows. The problem with it was, and think about this now, the idea is watch TV anytime, anywhere you want to. So we have this thing called friend casting. It's like, okay, um, you know, Aunt, you and I are going to watch a show tonight on TV, eight o'clock, turn on your computer, I'm going to turn on my computer, we're going to watch it together. What if you're late? all of a sudden the thing breaks down. But the TV executives didn't get this. And so they, they, we kept giving feedback to them saying, we understand this audience, we've, we've, we've done the research, we're inventing this for a different type of experience. And they said, no, 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 we have to do this, we have to do this, and they didn't listen. And so we spent about six months doing this, and we came up with this prototype, 
which is nothing like what Hulu looks like today, is not what it looked like when it launches. But one of the things that you can't see in here, but you kind of can see in here, but if you can play with it, is that there are little buttons everywhere, over here, down here, and all these buttons do is try to get you to watch something else. So there's like, now playing, so The Simpsons, you can watch more Simpsons, there's related episodes, you can watch more related episodes, there's other details that might give you to other shows. The whole thing was antithetical to what this product was, and it was because no one, no one kind of at the, at the high level would listen to what this product was all about. So what halfway through the process, this guy named Jason Kalar gets hired to be the CEO of, of this thing called Hulu. At the time it was called Syrup. And um, he comes in and he looks at all this stuff and he says, he says to me and a friend of mine who are running the project, he's like, there's a, lot, there's a lot going on here. How did we get here? And my friend and I look at him and we're like, well, let us tell you, because it is crazy. And we went through all these things and he's like, okay, it's interesting. And we said, but look, look, this is what they should do. Just whatever you do, this is what this product should be. So it's like, okay. And the next day, it was, it was probably the next week, he, he comes back to the team that was working on this project and he fires everyone. And he says, get out NBC, get out Fox, get out your entire team. And he says to me and my friend Kevin, he's like, you two need to move from New York to Los Angeles and we're gonna start from scratch and we're gonna build this whole thing in six weeks. And in six weeks, we, the way we did this was we had a team now, instead of 40 people, we had a team of four. It was me, my friend Kevin, the Eric who was a CTO, and Jason who was a CEO. And we, um, every morning, would brainstorm. What should we do for a player? What would search look like? What would a show page look like? And we would argue, and we would argue. Because Jason was from Amazon, so he was very much about like people commenting on shows. And we were like, no, people want to watch shows. And you know, we'd have these battles, but what was really interesting is we listened to each other. We'd draw things on the board and, and kind of um, debate things back and forth until we came up with something that was stronger. And so when we launched it later on, like, later on the year in October, this is what the first version of Hulu looks like. Now what you see is that there, are, there are some buttons in here, don't get me wrong, but they're all things that relate to what you're watching. You can pop it out and watch it in the corner of your screen if you're at work and want to be able to quickly get rid of it. You can dim the lights if you want to have a more movie-like experience. You can go full screen. Um, but all the stuff that, like, that you can do, uh, do about watching other episodes was either down here, or more importantly, at the end of this, we'd show you other things. The best example of this, though, is um, uh, one day, we were trying to figure out how to create, um, create search results for, for the site. And Eric, the CTO, asked a very simple question. He's like, well, what happens if they search for a show that's not on Hulu? Fairly standard question, no, a null, set, null result set. And their initial reaction was, well, we'll just show them other things that are like that. So if they search for a popular show at the time was Lost, if they search for Lost, we'll show them Star Trek or Star Trek The Next Generation or Battlestar Galactica. We all kind of sat there like, that doesn't feel right. And I think someone actually said that, because that doesn't feel like that's not what this should be. What could it be? And we started brainstorming and, 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 and like, no one shot the idea down. Like, it was the most common you know, result at the time. But then someone had this other idea that was like, what if we just told them where they could go to watch Lost? What if we could just say, you know what, we don't have this, but you can go to abc.com and watch Lost, and more power to you. And at first everyone was like, no, that's stupid, what a terrible idea, which is not good feedback. <laughs> um, and then we all kind of thought about it, and we're like, wait a minute, if our whole purpose is to let people watch TV when they want to watch it, where they want to watch it, let them go watch it on, on ABC. The next time they want to watch a show, maybe they'll come back here and try to find it on Hulu, and then we'll have done our job right. And so like, that kind of like, positive reinforcement, that kind of feedback where we were helping each other, we were listening to each other, helped make this product succeed in the very beginning. Whereas if we had launched with you know, this piece of garbage um, that was chock full of technology without thinking about how people actually want to use this, without thinking about the real mantra of the, um, of the product, you know, I, think, I think it would have failed a lot more quickly. Now you could argue that it had content that people wanted, so it would have been around for a little bit. But every detail from you know, what, how do we serve ads up? You know, what do we do about search results? What do we do about show pages? How do we get people to watch other things they might want to watch? All those, that thinking was about brainstorming together and listening to our feedback. So we're going to do a little exercise right now. Does anyone have any of the pads that they give out um, out there? Any paper? Or you, you can use your index cards, actually. I have, we'll, we'll get some more. Um, what I want you to do is going to do an exercise where individually, oh great, individually, um, you're going to draw and put your phones away, put your uh, computers away, I don't want you cheating. You're gonna draw Facebook 
as you think about it, from memory. Is, that, is everyone here on Facebook, by the way? You're not? What, you're not? Okay. Is anyone else on Facebook? Okay. We'll, we'll think about it. For those of you who are on Facebook, it's going to be interesting to see you try to give feedback here. <laughs> um, but, or draw, if you were on Facebook in the past, draw what your Facebook experience was like. So we're going to give you one minute. Like, this should be something that if, you're, if you aren't on it right now, you're never there. But if you are on it, you're probably there every day. So um, give it a shot. There are mostly not wrong answers here, so you'll probably be all right. That is okay? Okay, no worries. Oh, it's totally okay. Um, it's a shot in the dark. You figure, you know, you, you get most people on it. It's probably fine. Um, the point is to, to kind of drop a memory as to what you, you see. Um, and, you know, this doesn't have to be a work of art. It doesn't have to be pixel perfect. We're looking for sketches, you know, um, vague ideas. If you want to put detail in there, great. If you want to, like, quote what's on your timeline, that's fine, too. It's a little weird, but, you know, whatever works for you. You got about five seconds left, and then... Um, we're gonna we're gonna say about pencils down. All right, pencils down, pens down. Stop drawing. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. You guys are you guys are a pretty honest group. You guys are pretty open. You guys talkative. Good. You're going to be because what we're gonna do is we're gonna pair up, and you're gonna share your drawings with each other, and you're gonna tell each other um, hopefully what's good about it. But what you're gonna do is try to help that person improve their drawing so it's more accurate to what Facebook actually looks like, whether it's mobile or desktop. Doesn't matter either way. Um, based on your memory. And no, again, no peeking in your phones. This is about um, uh, thinking, thinking from memory and, and trying to you know, help someone do a better job. So you have five minutes to do both of your drawings, and you can start that now. Did you draw anything? Oh no. Well, she can maybe she can help you. Oh, she doesn't have Facebook, right? Well, join into another group. It's fine. There can be three people. Yeah, join with them. Did you guys draw Facebook? Okay, to start. No, it's okay. And do you have one? Do you use it at all? Yeah, do, you, do you use Facebook? Do you use it? Yes, but I. Oh, it's okay. Why don't you help him yeah, fill out? Uh, yes. Oh, great. Perfect. Great. I want to see that drawing at the end. <laughs> I, me too. <laughs> I had to take screenshots. I, you know, I don't know. Are you guys working together? 
neither me or the photo person was using that often. Wait, on, on mobile or you don't use it at all? No, uh, like we once it to be open. Okay, that's fine. But you, you got to, so you guys help each other out a little bit yeah, though. Yeah, yeah. Perfect, great, awesome. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Is working it out together? Are you guys helping each other fill out things? Yeah. I'm not being on Facebook, so. Okay, <laughs> but you got you got a good start there. He was saying it should look more like LinkedIn. It does look a little bit like LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe LinkedIn would have been good for this conference. I don't know. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Yeah, you guys helping each other? Yes. Great, perfect. I might call on you. How are you guys doing? That's okay. Well, this is going to be interesting then. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Well, this is even interesting to call up a memory. I mean, I think you guys are you're kind of getting it, though. I like it. You help each other out more. This is great. You got about a minute left, guys. How are you guys doing? Are you guys helping each other out in the drawings? Are they all starting to look similar? Or, uh, a little bit similar, and we similarly forgot I think what's on the left. <laughs> we have a group. This is going to be interesting. All right, I might bring you guys up then. This is good. This is good. We have 30 seconds to wrap everything up. Ant, did you learn a lot about Facebook just now? I did. Good, yeah. good. More than I bet, I bet. <laughs> All reasons why you don't want to join it. Yeah, I'm not going to sign up Okay. <laughs> oh, good, good. All right, time's up, time's up. Um, who here drew desktop versions of Facebook? Who here drew mobile? Did anyone drive mobile? You, you guys, you do okay. So let's do this. Um, I'm gonna have you guys come up, and we're gonna talk about desktop. Um, come on. It's a workshop, or not just not just about me. <laughs> so this is what Facebook looks like today. This is a screenshot I took yesterday, so it's pretty accurate, I hope. Um, and uh, so let's talk about your drawings. How how close did you guys get to to this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I, I feel more like 30 to 40. <laughs> okay, okay. But we are very, it seems like we are very lousy Facebook users. <laughs> okay, okay. It sounds like we had a lot of lousy Facebook users in here, which is going to make this super fun. Because <laughs> we're just talking about Facebook for the next 85 minutes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, what, uh, what did you guys talk about when, you, when you're looking at each other's uh, drawings? How did you guys critique them? Uh, we were saying to fill in blanks or something the other person may have missed out. Mm -hmm. There's a login button or a profile, your name at the top there. Mm -hmm. There is this left section also. So, uh, other person's blind spot, maybe that is the first thing that I have to spot and fill in. And the other yeah. what, other feedback did, what other feedback did you give? Uh, what we, I, actually, we didn't really have time because time was a lot for okay. the feedback. But I remember that the feedback I wanted to give you <laughs> is that exactly what you're saying was it the parts that I will kind of remember it and uh, the blind spots and, and that. So not, not critique, it was, it, was, it was more helping the other person to get more accurate images. But accurate names for each other. Got it. For, for my lovely perspective. No, no, that's, that's great. That's perfect. <laughs> Love it. Excellent. Good. Good job. Thank you. Um, can I have you guys come up here? You guys look at the, yeah, you two. You were working very closely together. You guys did mobile, right? Or one of you did mobile? Yep. Sure. Okay. mobile. Great. Um, this is going to be great then. Okay. So just for those of you who don't know Facebook mobile, this is what that looks like today. Um, very different than desktop, obviously. Um, so let's start with uh, the mobile stuff. So when you first looked at her mobile drawing, what did you? What was your reaction? What did you say to her? Uh, I remember I was <laughs> mobile version of uh, Similar, okay. Just some icons missing in the footer, mm -hmm. and the other 
think in the camera repository and the messenger option mm -hmm. and also the storage but so oh, you're missing out of things <laughs> that's 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 totally fine like i said this is not about being pixel perfect um it's about helping each other so what like what what kind of stuff did uh did you change in your drawing based on what, what you were what you guys talked about Okay. <laughs> okay. And how about your, your desktop drawing? How did you guys work on that together? Mm -hmm. yeah, um, pretty similar about the conversion, just missing the stories and the other that we don't keep notifications that we cannot see. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, of, a lot of details that just kind of came out of it. Yes, but it's pretty similar. That's okay. All right, great, awesome, cool. What, what, for you guys, was there anything like, you, when you looked at each other's drawings, you were like, oh my God, I wanna put that into mine? Yeah, and and did you do that? Did you, okay. So the whole point of this is like to, to listen to, like you said, uh, you, you guys listen to each other and, and, and kind of, even if you hadn't been on in a while, you kind of thought about those details. Like that kind of feedback, where you're open to it and able to like quickly adapt to it, that's something that we do all the time. Like we'll often sit there and like I'll I'll go in with a with one of my team members, uh, like a UX person, and we'll be whiteboarding things or we'll come in with drawings and we'll look at each other and so we'll like be like I want to steal that, I want to steal that. But it's all about like positive reinforcement. It's all about I'm like I really love this thing that you did and I want to I want to use that um, and that or that thing that you did uh, really fits with the strategy. I think that like that would work well over here and during the product process or even after a product launches, being able to kind of stay positive that way and, and really listen to each other is something that makes things work. Because you know who doesn't like to listen? Facebook. Um, Facebook in 2009, this is what it looked like. And the big thing was that they had this news feed and everyone was like, you know, aghast that this, this invention had happened. Now, the thing is that Facebook likes to make changes. They make them all the time. And it changes their look again and again and again. <laughs> And again, here we are today. And you know what, what happens is Facebook changes it so often that everyone who uses Facebook gets mad at them and sends them all this negative feedback and people, for the most part, maybe not the people in this room, but people for the most part keep using it. Um, and they keep using it because it's just something you have, for a lot of people, they have to be on. Their grandkids are on there, their kids are on there, or sisters, brothers, friends. And so it's kind of become this thing where Facebook can kind of do whatever it wants and doesn't ever have to listen to people. In a kind of a Steve Jobs kind of way, where you know Steve Jobs didn't like to do research, he was just like, I know what people want, which is none of us are Steve Jobs. Like, like it's a it's a it's a dumb way of doing things. Like, listening to people can be really effective, um, and and Facebook not having to do that has created this this um, theory out there in, in the product world where we don't have to listen to people either, uh, and we can just do what we want. Uh, there's a, a site called TechCrunch in, uh, that covers the tech industry. It was founded by this guy named Michael Arrington, and they used to do a lot of redesigns, and the thing about redesigns is that everyone hates them. Like every time a redesign launches, people are like, this is the worst thing ever. I'm never coming back to this. And so TechCrunch would do a redesign, and people would be like, I'm never, I'm never coming back to this. This site is garbage. It's terrible. And how dare you, you know, change how I read my news? And so Arrington once, put, uh, it was like 2012, I think, published all these comments from people in an article. Like, this is what everyone said about our redesign and why everyone hates it. That's all those comments that I kind of just quoted in the stream. And at the end of it, he says, and those are the comments from our last redesign, and no one left. And so, like, all that negative negativity didn't really make a difference. And I kind of think that's true when it comes to feedback in general. Negative feedback doesn't help. Um, it doesn't make someone inspire, it doesn't inspire someone to want to change something to iterate. And we, we're, we're working digital. Like, if we're not iterating, we're dead. Um, the, the internet is never done. And so, any product we work on, should be poising itself to get better. And the way we get better is by listening to each other and to our audience. And if our audience only has shit things to say, then we're not gonna be able to make any improvements. Speaking of which, it's time for some critiques. So, did anyone write anything down on a card that they would like to share about me? You don't have to have written it down, you can also just shout it out. Everyone's very quiet right now. Speak a little slowly, thank you. That's, that's a really good piece of criticism. I get that often. <laughs> I will definitely start speaking more slowly. Um, and, and by the way, if I don't, call me out on it. I deserve it. So mostly in this talk, we're, we're supposed to be um, getting at what happens after you launch. 
how do you use feedback to become better after you launch? So first of all, let's just, let's just put it out there. Launching anything is hard. So if you put something out there, if you got, who here has launched a product ever? Yeah, right? Good job. It's hard. Um, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of people sometimes. It takes some money. It takes whatever. Like, you got it out there. We work with so many people who often don't ever get it out there that that's the first step. But once it's out there, then what do you do? Like, how do you, how do you move forward? Because I don't know about you guys, but some of the stuff I put out there on the internet is pretty terrible. And I, I, it, I like what Reid Hoffman says is that like, if you're not embarrassed by basically the first, time you, the first thing you make, then you're not doing it right. Um, the internet is full of first attempts. Um, the internet is full of first attempts I've been working on since 1995, and they're out there, and they're in the Wayback Machine, and they're embarrassing. And sometimes I look them up, and it's a really good way to remain humble, because they're not good. But the thing is that, that when we put things out there, they have to evolve. And one of the things that we often find happens is that people get kind of these mindsets like, well, I want my product to be this thing, and I want it to get here, and I have this clear way of getting here, therefore that's the only way I can do it. But that's not necessarily true, because one of the great things about launching something is you immediately put out in the world and learn what worked and what didn't work. And one of the things that we always tell our clients on our kickoff meetings, we're like, listen, if we are 70% right, we are winning because we are going to be wrong about things. It's so true every time we do a design that like we do a lot of research, we look at data, but you know, sometimes we're gonna be wrong and let's, let's learn from that and let's adjust accordingly. Uh, one of the biggest things about product design is that you know, the, people's habits change. Tech changes all the time, and so we have to adapt to that stuff too. We, so we have to be willing to look at our roadmaps, and this is why Agile is such an important uh, process, so that we can say, okay, in these two weeks we're going to do this. This thing is scheduled for six weeks from now, but you know what? We can move this earlier because it's all of a sudden become a priority. Um, and sometimes that, that priority is because someone up top, that was a really important thing. And sometimes it's because we realize, oh my god, users are like, just want this thing so bad. So let's talk about how we do that, and how we do that from a... Um, a building block standpoint. So I have two stories about this company, The Block. Uh, it's called theblockcrypto.com. If you're into cryptocurrency and blockchain, it's supposed to be one of the go-to news sources for, um, for that industry. So The Block is an interesting product in that it's a brand new news site, new brand, launched in September of last year. And we did UX design, branding, coded. We, my company did all of this for it. Um, but one of the problems was the founder of this, for better or worse, he wanted to launch. Unlike the founders who have launched paralysis and are constantly adding features, he was like, I just need to get this out there. I just need to get this out there. And so one of the things we had to learn was how to cut. And the way we learned how to cut was by listening to what people out in the world really wanted from this. Because he had been, he got a huge Twitter following from uh, starting this brand. He got he created a private Slack group, so he, we already had kind of feedback coming in about what people wanted from this. But we designed, you know, a pre, this is just the homepage. We designed a lot of things to, to, for the launch with. So on this one page, which is kind of a, a read, the whole the whole design is, is to be like you don't have to ever go into an article page. Um, is like you have you know your 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 coin prices up here and a link to a, a marketplace for coins. You have different types of posts, long form and short form. You have recirculation. You have sponsored posts with that orange one there. You have uh, coins tied to stories, and you have related stories. There's a lot of stuff going on here. And, and what we realized, because he wanted to launch you know, within five weeks as opposed to like 12 weeks of when we finished design, we were like, we need to figure out what matters. And when, when it came down to it, and thinking about Hulu with the, uh, the way we had watch anything you want, anywhere you want, this was all about consuming. It was all about the content. So you know what doesn't matter? Like half the stuff on this page. So when we launched it, you can see side by side, we just took away stuff. We took away related coins. We took away the, the, uh, this, this kind of navigation that you can't really see right here. We took away this top hat and just simplified. And oftentimes, that's what feedback is really all about. It's about simplifying. And our audience was just like, we just want to know the news. Like, all this other stuff is great, blah, blah, blah. We can get it elsewhere. But this is what we want. And so we created a plan where over the course of you know, three or four months, we could slowly start adding things in. Um, but you know the road the roadmap also changed. So you know a month later we did add in that top hat. We added in you know um, some navigation. But you don't really see us adding in those side pieces 
Uh, instead, we prioritized something else, which was a paid product, which came up in the middle of the, middle of the night, I think, when I got an email from uh, the guy who founded this being like, we need to make money, we need to start a subscription service, we need to get this up in two weeks, change the roadmap. And so that was feedback he was getting from his investors. Like, what is your, what is your product gonna do? How are you gonna make money? You have no advertising <laughs> and you have a really big audience. So within you know, three or four weeks, we rebranded this, this thing uh, at the top here, which is basically their paid product. Uh, it's called the Block Genesis. And it launched at $1,000 a year, which I thought was ridiculously expensive. And you know, within the first couple of days, they had like 60 people paying um, you know, $1,000 a year, which is not a lot of people, but that's $60,000 a year. And then that went up to 100, then went up to 200. And you know, it, it stuck with his strategy of, I wanna make this about the news. We could, all the bells and whistles, we can think about later. But that feedback from him was really helpful. Um, here's an example of something that was not helpful and how not to get feedback. He, uh, <laughs> I, was on, I was at a conference in Arizona in like July of last year. We were in the middle of the branding process, designing the logo for this and the, and the brand and identity. And I get a call from my creative director, um, my business partner. He's like, you need to go to Twitter right now. And I'm like, uh-oh. And then Twitter, I, and I, wanted, I wish I could show you this tweet, but I, I went back on Twitter yesterday looking for it, and it actually um, was deleted because <laughs> he had posted up on his, and he tweets all the time. He gets kicked off Twitter all the time, too. Uh, he posted up, you know, decisions, decisions, and it was the final two logos that we were down to. Now, that may not seem like a big deal, but in the world of design, like, you don't share out the design process because everyone has an opinion and not everyone's right you know and they don't know the strategy behind why this logo might be better than another logo and, and maybe the other logo would have been better who knows but you don't crowdsource that because if you do you lose the whole point of doing an exercise like that in the first place and so i called him on the phone and i'm like listen man like you can't do this like you can't crowdsource your logo he's like yeah but i'm so excited i'm like i'm excited too i really want this to launch but you're going to get people and he did start having conversations and start to like break down you know why this logo is like this and why why is it blue or why is it that shape and i don't think it should be that shape and then they're going to start offering their own logos and so you get this like huge cycle of feedback um on twitter that is not useful it's just noise and it's noise that gets in the way of of understanding you know what what should this product be why are we going this direction um so you know he he by the way he did this twice i want to be honest with you he did this once about logo and then like a month later Another call from my creative director is like, you have to check Twitter, Twitter, and I'm like, okay, here we go again. And this time he had posted our entire brand book to Twitter, being like, I'm so excited to have the brand done. Like, look at how great it is. And um, the problem with that is a couple things. One is you shouldn't do that. But the, the bigger one is that in the brand book, which is a, a document that is internal to the company, something that is meant to like, I can give you and say, this is everything you need to know as a new employee, it has things like, here are our competitors. Here's what we think about our competitors. Here's why our competitors are suck or whatever, you know. And um, you know, you don't want to put that out there on the internet for everyone to steal. And so uh, uh, he's like, "I'll take it down." I'm like, "It's already out there. Like, don't you understand how the internet works?" Um, so again, not not a good way to uh, to really get feedback from your competitors when you're just telling them how bad they are. Uh, but but I think that the idea of of taking a Taking feedback from an internal team so that you can launch more smartly, even though you've done all the work, is something that we also try to think about. And oftentimes, by the way, this comes from the engineers who look at our designs and they're like, oh no, what did you guys do? Like, this is too much. We can't launch within this date. We have a, we have a, you know, a deadline. Um, the way we solve that is we bring engineers into all of our design meetings so that, or, or we review the design before with engineers so that they can give us all the feedback so that when we go, we go to a client, or we go to something internally, we're not presenting something that can't be done. So that kind of feedback internally before we get it, even get out there is so important because the last thing I want to do is make a promise that we're going to deliver all this stuff and then the engineering team gets like a stack of designs and say, this is going to take six months longer than we thought, we thought it would. But after you launch, there are different ways of getting um, feedback as well. And, and so one of the th things I've divided this into is analytics and people. And so Analytics, this, this, this is just a handful of examples. I'm sure you guys have used Google Analytics or uh, Crazy Egg or, or Sail Through or whatever. These are all just ways to measure success. Um, and these are really only good if you know what success means, right? 
like you could go, this is one of my big problems with Google Analytics, though they've gotten better, is when you go there, they're like, here's how many page views you have. Okay, is that, is that good? Is that bad? I guess compared to last month, that could be better or worse, but like, what do I need them to be, you know? Um, with something like Chartbeat, you can see how far someone got down the page, or with Crazy Egg, maybe I can see where they tried to click. And I've used these kind of things for, and this one type of feedback, for redesigns. Uh, I worked on a redesign for Billboard magazine a couple years ago. Their music magazine been around for about 100 years, and they have a challenge in that they're not very relevant, so they're very much kind of clickbait now. So you go, you find them on Google or Twitter or whatever, and someone wrote a, uh, an article about Lady Gaga, so you go to this article page about Lady Gaga. So they wanted to increase their page views by, I think it was like 50% or 60%, and they didn't want to pay for user research. So all the users on the side over there that we haven't talked about yet didn't care about them. They're like, just figure it out through the data. I'm sure it won't be a problem. So we use Crazy Egg, which is a heat mapping tool, and Google Analytics combined to figure out like what, like what can we find here to make this happen. Uh, what we did find was that they had all these articles on Lady Gaga, and if people went to an article about Lady Gaga, there would be a big, big, glowing uh, click cloud around her name in the middle of an article. But there was no link there. People were just trying to click it. So we did some more testing, and we found in other articles, everyone's trying to click on celebrity names, and there's nowhere for them to go. They had no artist pages on a website built around the music industry. So we're like, here's an idea. Perhaps you should make artist pages, or just tag pages for artists, and then you know put links to them in the stories. And they're like, well, that's, that's a new type of page. We're like, yeah, it's a little bit of effort, but let's just try it. So we redesigned the article page to have links in it and actually highlight who was in the story, if it was more than one celebrity. And just that change alone, through analytics, through the feedback of click, click clouds, um, we were able to change their business. Their, their um, page views went up 98% from that one change, um, which is ridiculous. <laughs> but, so that's one thing. On the user side, you know, we go and do a couple different types of research. We'll do ethnographic research, where we go and we, um, we talk to people in, in their houses and their environments and try to understand kind of what they're all about and, and see their frustrations firsthand. Sometimes we do usability analysis and, and we like, you know, um, we look at them using a site and see specific, specifically how certain paths go. Uh, sometimes we do surveys, though I'm not a huge fan of surveys because they're binary and you don't always get the right questions. But there's a wrong way to do user research as well. And some people like it. Uh, some people like, I guess it's a guerrilla research. I am not a fan of this um, because I think the lack of context around design can be problematic. I'll give you an example of that. A few years ago, we had a client in the personal finance space. Very not warm, fuzzy, personal kind of product, very much a banking kind of product. And, and uh, they, they were really obsessed with the site being beautiful. They were like, we just want to have the most beautiful financial services site in the world. Well, what the hell does that mean? Like, <laughs> beauty is subjective. Um, and so we got through the UX process, we got through half the design process, and we go to a meeting with them, and, we say that, and, and we're like reviewing designs, and it's very tense. And they're not like being mean, and they're not being insulting, they're not giving any feedback at all. They're just sitting there silently nodding, like, mm -hmm, yep, as we present things. And finally, my colleague says to them, I'm sorry, is, is there something wrong? Like, everything was really going well last week. What's, what's different this week? And they said, yeah, you know, um, we did some testing over the week to see if, you know, the designs resonated with our audience. And, um, and you know, we just, we don't feel like it's, it's really going the right direction. I'm like, oh, okay, what, what was the problem? What, what kind of research did you do? And they said, well, we did the caribou method, and, um, and then you know, we talked to people. And the problem is that I've been doing research for, let's say, 15 years. My colleague, about 10 years. Neither of us had heard of the caribou method. Um, we also were too afraid at the moment to say, what is the caribou method, because we didn't want to feel stupid, you know? <laughs> and so we... Uh, we listened to them for a little bit, and finally my, my friend says, look, I'm so sorry, I, I apologize, but I just don't know what this caribou method is. Like, could you, I, I'm embarrassed, like, could you tell me what it is? We, we, I'd love to know. And, she, and, and the client says back, well, what we did was we took the designs that you gave us, and we printed them out. Now here's the first problem. You don't print out designs meant to be looked at on a screen, they will never look the right way. 
Then we took said printed designs and we went downstairs into the lobby of our office building where there is a place called Caribou Coffee. It's a coffee shop. And then we went up to random strangers and said, is this beautiful? <laughs> to which the random stranger, having no idea what this was, was like, no. <laughs> and you know what? They were right. Because it's a personal finance site. <laughs> it's not supposed to be beautiful. Um, so we got fired. And um, <laughs> that actually is true. We did get fired. Um, it was better for them. Uh, but, but that kind of feedback isn't helpful, right? Because with no context, Either you're gonna say, no, it's not beautiful, or you're gonna to try to find something. People wanna be helpful. They wanna look at something and say, yeah, I, I mean, I guess it could be beautiful if you did this, or you know, that, that image is beautiful. The rest of it, I don't know. And so without context about what you're trying to test and what kind of feedback you're trying to get, you know, I, I, uh, I think that, that we wanna you know, kind of set ourselves up for success. So I thought maybe we'd, we'd try this a little bit where um, you've listened to me gonna go on about this. I want you guys to pair up again um, and do some little, have a conversation. Talk about some things that you've worked on where either analytics or user research either helped, I'd love an anecdote about that, or where you would have liked to have had that feedback and why it would have helped. It's five minutes, jot down a couple notes. I can't wait to hear what you, have, what you guys come up with. Here, talk to each other. Um, it can work either way, but it's something that you've worked on where either you've used analytics or user research to make it better, or um, uh, where you would have liked to have. Yeah, yeah, in any particular example you can give, it would be great. Hopefully you're each telling each other stories. I'm <laughs> 
So we should be wrapping up your stories about now. I am going to call on some of you. Don't you worry. I was like, I was like, oh, wow, you really don't want to be called on. I'm good, thanks. All right. You guys were talking a lot. I love it. I love it. Um, so, you guys were talking a lot. I want. We're gonna start with you guys. What What were you like? What What, what kind of came up around anal analytics and people that has been uh, relevant to you guys? It's branding right there, yeah, yeah. totally, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Awesome. And went back there. That's 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 totally right. Um, back there, and you guys were talking a lot as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I always say that like the analytics can tell you what's going on, but they, it can't tell you why, and the people always kind of do give you that why answer. Yeah. Right, right. That's a great example. Absolutely. That's why I love usability testing for that reason. You, you, it, the hardest thing about usability testing is watching somebody take a usability test or, or go through it. Because you just want to be like, no, it's right, it's right there. It's right there. Come on. <laughs> and when you're moderating it, it's even worse. <laughs> Um, this is this is great. You guys you guys totally get the the, the value of both of those things, which which is um, something so important. Uh, we 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 often see one or the other, and, and user user research is always something people are like, well, we don't need to do that. Like I I use the internet. It's like one of the things we I think it's some, somewhere later in here. I say like you are not the user. You know we are users. We are we are not the user. We could be a user, right? So looking at how people use things and think about things and what their motivations are 
Like, how can we make decisions without that? And we'll talk a little bit about that later too. So, one of the hardest things is in your own head when you're creating something is looking at what's hot out there. So over the years, there are things that have been hot that like people come to us and they say, I want my homepage to look like Pinterest. And I'm like, why would you want that? That is ugly and not usable, but, but works for them. And right now the big thing is um, Bitcoin or um, actually uh, uh, any sort of uh, cryptocurrency. Everyone wants to have a coin and it's like, why? Does, it, does that fit your brand? Um, when iOS 7 came out, you know, everything went from skeuomorphic to flat. Uh, in, that was, which I think was a good thing, personally. But like, it was very much like chasing these trends. And you know, one of the things that it's important to do as a team member when working on a project is to is to check ourselves. Are we doing this because we're doing it for the right reason for the product? Or are we doing it because someone else is doing it? My favorite example of this, and this is where so many organizations did not listen to feedback, is is this one right here, the, uh, the carousel. We've all seen that on a site where like you get to a news site or something and it, you have one thing and then it slides to the next thing and then it slides to the next thing. The carousel is the biggest failure in the history of the internet, in my opinion, and everyone tried to use it because someone, it was like Yahoo News or something, created it in the mid 2000s because the worry was in news organizations that nothing, not enough stuff was above the fold, you know? And so like, well, if we cram all these things behind a carousel, um, then you know, every, every type of article could be represented. You could have a sports article, a news article, an entertainment article. The problem is that a carousel doesn't work. The, the carousel assumes that someone is looking at their computer like this. Oh, yeah, oh shit, I clicked the wrong thing. And the reason why people don't do that is that the internet is an active medium. So all these news sites were like, I can get my stuff above the fold. And what would happen is people would click on the first article, 80% of the time. Maybe like you'd get a drop off down to like 20% of the second article and then nothing after that. But everyone kept doing it because everyone else was doing it. And this is where like looking at feedback is one of those interesting things because all the analytics told you the story. You didn't even need the why. It's like, yeah, the drop off is here on every single carousel. It's very, very clear analytics. But people kept doing it because they thought it was working for someone else. It's like, oh, if New York Times does it, then CNN should do it. If CNN does it, then you know, uh, Time Magazine should do it or whatever. And the, the case is that looking at what other people are doing, are doing doesn't help you. It's not feedback at all. It's, in fact, it's much like the, uh, the negative comments from the tech country design. It's just noise. Like, focus on what you're doing and, and look for feedback that's going to be useful and actionable. Um, the other thing around design feedback is that it's those little things, those little iterations that, that we can learn a lot from. And unlike you know, Facebook, who doesn't like to listen to its audience, there is a company that does, and it's Amazon. Now, Amazon has many problems, and I'll admit this, but what Amazon did really smartly was use analytics to understand, use analytics and usability, I'm sorry, to understand how they can evolve. Just one little piece. And for those of you who don't know, Amazon does about 98 A-B tests on each page of their site every single day. Like, every pixel is being tested. So I want to talk about one part of Amazon, though. One part that has changed significantly in the past 20 years, and that is the Amazon navigation. So when it started, actually, there was even less navigation, but let's you know give them some benefit of the doubt here. So in like 1999 or 2000, Amazon started selling things beyond just books, right? Books, music, videos, whatever. And they had this tab system, and I don't know who was around at that point, but let me tell you something, the tab system that Amazon created, everyone thought it was amazing, and they tried to patent it. It, it did not go through. But they tried to patent this design. And the interesting thing about it was, you know, it works. You know, you have, you know, six items, maybe eight items, nine items, it's pretty good. Then, then you start adding more things, it gets a little more complicated here. You're adding rows, and then rows. It doesn't scale, right. There was at one point, um, I don't have this on, the, on this uh, slide anymore, but um, there, at one point there were actually three rows of tra tabs here because they had so much stuff. And then they were like, okay, we're getting a little busy. And this is, you know, this is from feedback internally. They, the UX people really talked about this. And, um, and so they, uh, oh, there we go. Um, they went to a one tab system. 
Now, I don't know if you guys remember this, but if you clicked on all categories back uh, then, this was a terrible idea, by the way. Click on all categories, you got this huge modal of like 30 things. And you were like, ah, well, I don't know what to do. Close it. Let me close it. I'm just going to search. <laughs> um, so they realized very quickly that from analytics that that wasn't working for them. Um, but search started to become more and more important. But what they did was they realized they needed more scalable navigation. So then they went to a left-handed navigation. It's great. You can stack things, put them in bigger categories, have dynamic menus that come out. Seems like a good idea. Except this got longer and longer and longer and longer. And people said, I don't, I'm never going to use that. It just it, it doesn't work. So then Amazon went and said, you know what? I'm just going to do this. We're just going to be like Google. Just a search bar. That's it. That's all you need. And you know what's great is Amazon could do that in whatever that was, 2013 or whatever. Um, because at that point, they'd been around long enough. They'd heard everything from everyone about what worked about their product and what didn't. That they said, we, can, we understand our users well enough to know that if we have a search bar here, we don't need anything else. And that's pretty much how it stayed till today. Same thing. You go to Amazon, this is probably a month or two ago. Same thing, just a search box. Here's, remember that tracing trend slide from a couple of minutes ago? Here's what happens now. If people come to us or anyone and they want to create a product and be like, well, I'm doing a store, so I don't need navigation. I just need search because Amazon does that. And it's like, yes, Amazon can get away with that. But imagine if in 1997, Jeff Bezos launches a bookstore online with no categories and just a search bar. Buy some books. Look for what you want. It wouldn't have worked. It had to evolve. And it, and it evolved through iteration. And that iteration came from understanding you know, how people want to use this, listening to how people use it, watching where they're failing, that big modal, for example, and then moving on. Speaking of moving on, let's try this again. Um, anyone have any feedback from me? Am I speaking better now, or am I going too fast still? I was just kidding. You're, you <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> any other feedback? Good, bad? Thank you so much. Great, awesome. I like positive feedback. We should be more positive on our feedback, shouldn't we? Isn't that nicer? <laughs> you put something, I design things for a living, right? You can probably relate to this. Like you put something in front of someone and all you're doing is looking to be criticized. <laughs> like you spend hours and hours working on something and you're like, cool, tell me what's wrong with this. Which is good, it's good to improve it, but it's nice to have a positive comment too. I always say that about clients, I'm like, can you lead with the positive and we'll get better. Um, so now we're gonna talk about the process of feedback. Uh, I think that feedback is such an important part of the conversation. Um, and it can come from anywhere, right? You know, we, we, I mentioned engineers earlier. When we're in design meetings, I want project managers there, UX people, designers, clients, subject matter experts. Like, I want people there because everyone is gonna have a, have a lens onto this product in a way that I don't, right? So I might come at it from a design standpoint, or I might come at it from a usability standpoint, but I don't know the difficulty from an engineering standpoint. I also don't know what you've done before. So I'll give you an example of that. I was uh, designing a fashion site for this fashion designer in America called Nicole Miller. She's known for like kind of pattern dresses. Doesn't really matter. But um, it was an e-commerce experience and we had designed this like one page checkout. And we were so proud of it. We were like, you know, you can get through it in one, one page. It's like next, 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 you're done. Checkout, boom. And the engineers looked at that and they're like, yeah, we can build this, but it's not gonna work. We're like, what do you mean? It's easy. Like, yeah, we've, we've built that before. We've tested it. It fails. This is the one that works. This is the checkout process that always succeeds. And so we looked at theirs, and it was more than one page. But it was simple. It was very easy to get through. And they were totally right. And so not having them in that room would have led us down the wrong path. So having those different opinions are important. The, ch the challenge is that like most of us, when we have opinions, think that, they're, think that we're right. right? We, we have an opinion because it's, it's about what we're trained to think. So it's, it's understanding who to listen to, when to listen to, and how to apply that that we really have to do. Uh, and that's someone's job. It could be my job as the, as the UX lead on a project. It could be the client's job. Um, but oftentimes, it's, it's someone who has to understand this feedback makes sense at this time, and this feedback does not, um, which is hard sometimes, especially like you have a bunch of really smart people in a room. One of the other challenges is that everyone has ideas, and we can keep spinning our wheels until um, you know, we don't, we don't actually get anything done. My, my favorite example of this is, um, I worked on this project, God, it must have been 10 years ago. It was a virtual, do you remember like virtual worlds? Like, um, yeah? Yeah, they were good, like Second Life, whatever. So I worked on this virtual world. Here's the thing. It started as an online poker game, which 
which you wouldn't expect. But it was just a poker game, like any other online gambling poker game. And um, you could go there and play against other people, bet money, simple enough. But the people who were working on this had a lot of ideas. And they were like, we love online poker, but everyone can play online poker over here. What else can we do that's kind of fun? And so they said, well, what do people do when they play poker? Well, they talk to each other. OK, so we'll add a chat function. But that's not really interesting. What else do people do? Oh, they listen to music. Let's put the ability for people to DJ with each other while they're playing online poker. So we're playing poker. I put on some Lady Gaga. And you're like, yeah, I don't really want to listen to that. I'm going to put on you know, some, some Bauhaus. And uh, I'm assuming you listen to Bauhaus. And, um, and then you're like, I don't like Bauhaus. Too, too negative. I want some Britney Spears, whatever. And so that was interesting. And they, they added that in. And that, that should have really been the end of it. But then someone said this, asked this question. This gets down to focus and feedback. Not what do people do when they play poker. What do people do when they listen to music? And all of a sudden, the virtual world was born, where it's like, well, they dance. So we got to let people get out of the poker room and go into the club and dance, obviously. And so they built a dance room. And then they were like, well, what do people do when they dance? They want to hook up. This is true. <laughs> and so they made like male avatars and female avatars. You can filter out the male or female, depending on what you're interested in. And then you could go talk to them. And then someone said, well, what if I don't like the music in the club? Because you like Bauhaus and you like Britney Spears. And I you know, like everything. Um, I just wanted to see it all. Uh, they're like, well, we should have different floors in this club. Remember the poker room's over here. Uh, and so we have different floors. We have like the pop floor, the country floor, the you know, industrial floor, or whatever. And so they have, now they have, so they have music and they have poker. And then they have, they have like, well, now we only have poker, so we need other games. So we have poker, we have shuffleboard, we have whatever. So now they have this gaming center, they have a dancing center, they have a media center where you can go and watch YouTube videos because you could just go to YouTube, but okay. By the way, this product has not launched at this point. It's still just one big flash file that takes about 20 minutes to download before you ever actually get to do anything. And finally, we said, and this is, I think, the best piece of feedback we gave them, we said, you should launch. You should put that out there and see what people think of this thing that you've made. And uh, they said, no, no, no. We're not done. We have one more thing we need to put into this. And we said, I, I don't even have anything to tell you. I can't imagine what else you could put into this club that you've made. And they say, this guy looks me straight in the eye, big South African guy, and he's like, books. <laughs> I said, you want people to read books in your club while people are playing poker and dancing? It's like, hey, you want to stop dancing and go read a book? And he said back to me, no, I don't want people to read books. I want people to write books. I was like, don't they have Microsoft Word? <laughs> He said, yes, but they could write a chapter, and then like you could write a chapter, and then you could write a chapter, and you could collaborate on these books together and have a library inside the club. And I said, I am firing myself from this client <laughs> because you're not listening to anything I'm saying or anyone. Um, they didn't launch. They lost all the money, and they failed. And so I think if they had actually put it out there and you know, what, you know what? The poker game thing was lame. It's true. But they probably would have learned a lot by actually putting something out there and listening to people. Because feedback works both ways. You know what? Like, I have a team of people, they work for me, but they really work with me, right? Like, we sit together every day, we whiteboard, and I tell them, like, look, come at me. Like, tell me everything I'm doing wrong, both, either, both as, a, as a manager, as a boss, but also, like, as a designer. I tell my clients the same thing. Every kickoff meeting, we are going to challenge you, you're going to challenge us. We might get into it a little bit, but it's for the better, betterment of the product. And that should be true with everything we do. It's like, like, why are we giving feedback? Why are we helping each other? We're doing it because we want to make the thing we're making better, solve the problem that we're trying to solve better. Except it's really hard. It's really hard to give good feedback. And you know what it is? Is I don't think anyone's ever taught to give feedback. Does anyone, was anyone here ever taught to give feedback? No? Yes? Anyone? No? Do you have to give feedback? Yeah. Coaching, yeah. That's a good point. And coaching is actually a good idea. Um, so I learned how to give feedback when I was in college. I was a creative writing minor because I wanted to be successful. And, um, and uh, in, in creative writing workshops, the way it works is you have like 10 people in a workshop, and everyone writes a story every week, except for one person. Um, no, sorry, sorry. Everyone, everyone writes a story every week, and everyone gets critiqued every week. So 
Bill has to read all of my, all the stories in the class, and he has to say, here's my critique of every story. And I have to read all the stories too. So I'm going to read his story, he's going to read my story. We're going to be telling each other about our stories, or what we think of them. The problem is, is that most people in college who are writing minors or majors are not good writers. We think we're good writers. We think we're the best writers. But we're terrible writers. And so you, I read your story, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> that was 10 pages of just utter shit. And what do I do? How do I tell you that? You know, Maybe it's not going to get much better. But it could get a little better, right? And so what we were taught, to, the way that we were taught to give feedback is you, know, you start with a positive. You started with a positive thing. Thank you. Um, you start with a positive. Like, there's got to be something in here. Like, I read some stories in college that I was just like, oh, I don't know. Like, there's, there's not much, there, that was a good adjective, you know. But really, it's hard. You know, you've you got to find those things. Because I think our knee-jerk reaction is to want to fix something. It's to want to tell people, like, this is what you need to do, right? Not in the collaborative way that we were doing earlier with the Facebook drawings, which I think was nice that you guys are helping each other find the details. But in, like, the, this is what works here. Because first of all, someone spent some time working on this, whether it's engineering, whether it's design, whether it's writing. You know, put, we do this for work, but you know, it does take energy, it does take thinking, and so people should be at least told that like, we acknowledge that you did this and this is something you did well. The other thing is you know, be actionable. Oftentimes we give feedback and it's not particularly actionable, it's just an opinion that we've put out in the world and it doesn't actually give you any direction to go in. I'll give some, some other examples of Feedback, feedback that doesn't work. Um, I know when I'll see it. Not helpful. I don't know what you. I don't know what you're seeing. I don't know what you want to see. Um, a little more detail would be useful. Also, I hate that. That's unfortunate, <laughs> you know. But some context. Why do you hate it? Is there some weird like psychological thing inside of you that made you hate it, or is it just wrong because it doesn't achieve the business goals? Any of those things could be helpful as to figuring out how we get to the next step. Um, I just don't like blue. That's okay. You know what? Maybe you're colorblind, maybe you had a bad experience with blue as a child, I don't know, but that doesn't help me move forward with the next step. Um, eh. <laughs> Actually, any noises at all are not useful feedback. We had a client once, this is amazing. She came in and looked at designs, and me and my business partner are standing there side by side, and like excited, it's first design review, and she looks at it and she goes, you know, it's eh, but I kind of want it to be eh. And my business partner, Chris, looks at her, this woman and he's like, I'm sorry, that is the single worst piece of feedback I've ever gotten in my entire life. <laughs> it's not helpful. The, the thing that's helpful is, is offering solutions. If you can find a way to translate what's bothering you about that particular design into what could make it better. Now, that doesn't mean you have to find it that, like, you don't have to solve the problem, right? Like, our job is to can go and, and, like, go back and, like, listen to what you said and figure out how do we translate that into an actual like design piece, but to understand why it's not working for you. For example, you know, I really wish this could flow a little better because it seems to me that it would take too long for someone to fill this out. That would be a good piece of feedback. Or something like, um, you know, uh, I really want this, to, this, this piece of content to be more prioritized and attract someone's eye more than that one. Those kind of things are much more useful than, you know, I just don't like this, sir. Eh. <laughs> also, there is a fine line between um, being honest and being insulting. Uh, and I mean that in the, you know, the most friendly way possible because I think oftentimes when we're trying to help people, we are being honest, but what we can cross a line sometimes. I've, I have certainly been guilty of this and been called out on it by my, uh, by my, my, my team. Uh, I'll say something like, you know, I think this is actually a step backwards, but, which by the way is not a useful piece of feedback. It's like, great, now, you, now you're not even telling I did good work, you're saying I did worse work than the work I did before. It's not really setting someone up for being motivated to do something better. So thinking about ways that we can say, instead of this is a step backwards, like, you know, I think we want to re-examine uh, how we're approaching this because maybe, you know, we might, have a, we might want to start a new direction. Um, and here's a direction we could try. Also being clear and being contextual. You know, not everything that we do or put in front of someone can have context. Um, like that, my whole thing of like, I don't like blue, like, okay, if you don't like blue, that's fine, but give me, give me some reasons why that doesn't work for the rest of the world as opposed to just you. Unless I'm making this just for you, in which case, if you don't like blue, I'll, I'll make it red, whatever works. Uh, also, having a real one-on-one -on -one conversation is so much better than playing a game of telephone. Or if you guys have played telephone, and you're telling one person, tell someone else, tell someone else, it gets distorted, right? It's like making a, a clone of something, you make a copy of a copy, it's not as good. 
And so making sure that you are the one giving the feedback or being clear about your feedback is it's going to help make that change more effective. And, and finally, you know, it's, it is a conversation. Like, not every piece of feedback is, I'm telling you this, now go do it. I think a lot of clients, in my case, would like that to be the case, but I don't believe in that. Like, I believe in listening to what they have to say and, and having a conversation to see what, like, if I can understand why they want to do something, and maybe we'll do it. You know, that's what we tried to do on Hulu from that earlier conversation, and they didn't want to listen. They didn't want to have that conversation. They just wanted to be like, make this. And make this is not how great products are made. Um, speaking of making great products, one more time, who has some feedback for me? Good stuff, bad stuff, shirt off, shirt on. Yeah. I'm so glad. You guys are so positive up here. Yeah. Oh, oh great. I was, I was afraid of trying this because I was like, this could either totally fail or people will get it. I don't know. Yeah, sorry. That's right. Yeah, I think, I think that's totally right. Uh, finding the right moments. And also, that gets back to also who do you get feedback from at various points, right? So like, let's say, here's a good example. So um, I'm working on a project right now yeah, with a with a financial institution, and they're not particularly visual people. That's fine, uh, but we have to put some stuff in front of them. So I have a UX designer working on uh, these concepts. That you know, I'm in India, she's in Hawaii, so the time distance difference is pretty amazing. Um, so we're having phone conversations about this stuff, and I'm asking her to show me stuff that's in progress, and it's not in any way close to done, right? It's just like here's some ideas scribbled on a page, but I know her well enough to know that like how she thinks, so I can give her really good feedback on that on a, let's say, beginning of the day, end of the day process. With a client, I'm showing that client this thing once a week. At best, maybe, you know, at best twice a week if it's a very fast project and they, we know how to work together. So I think it's not just about how often, but it's how often you show it and, and to who. Um, on a different project I was talking about earlier, how we put things in front of engineers, we'll do a, t a Tuesday review of wireframes or designs with the engineering team, listen to their feedback, revise it based on a Wednesday meeting with a client so that we are listening to the feedback from the right people at the right time before putting it in front of the next set of people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, we're going to get to like that kind of feedback in about a minute um, because because I, there is a surveys I think are challenging anyways. Um, but it's also important to know who you're sending it to and what how you're segmenting it because if you just throw a survey out there, it's kind of like that whole coffee shop example. If I just throw something at you and say, "Here's some questions," you know, maybe you're the right person for me to ask those questions. Maybe you're not. Um, so I, I think it's more about really defining who you need feedback from. And the same thing is true internally and externally, right? Um, if you're getting a survey every week, that would seem to me, unless it's narrowing down you know, a particular feature or whatever, a service or whatever, it seems to me that that would be too much, you know? Um, so, oh yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, that's true. And I don't know whether people have imbibed this concept of the whole thing so specifically uh, and so perfectly that you can start in a certain manner, but you can clearly make the distinction that there is something negative. And you'll be ready for it. 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 And you'll even if you know it's coming, it's good to know that there's something, you did something right, you know? I often, like, whenever I'm doing a first concept review and I'm putting it in front of someone, I'm like, I hope that if, at least part of this is okay. Because I know that half of it's wrong, you know what I mean? But let me, let me hear something good, you know? Um, otherwise, the, the project could go south. The problem here comes with, like, main intention behind giving a negative feedback to a person is to avoid the feedback. Uh, we cannot rely on that person's feedback. Is it just giving a 
I think it's I think it's good. I, I think positive feedback is actually useful because you know what maybe not what not what not to change, but you know at least what's working, so you can focus on the things that aren't working. If you if if you look at something and someone gives you bad comments about this thing and says nothing about this thing, well, all of a sudden my head's like, well, what do they think about this? Is this working? Is it not working? And then I go down a path that it's just a nightmare, um, and probably need to like relax a little bit. But I do think that having a sense of like where you can focus on improvement is important. So that's where positivity is really useful. Um, so we talked a lot about the different ways feedback works, and, and you know I think the best balance, kind of going back to the analytics and users thing, is is, is finding the right touch points and where, and where they are to make the right decisions because there is no one right source. Um, uh, and, and I think we all kind of have kind of agreed to that on this in this conversation. Um, I want to touch on one last thing. We, we kind of talked a little bit about it, which is the fact that we are not the user. Um, and uh, I think a better way of putting that is you can't force people to do what you want. And we, all of us, try to do this a lot in design. You know what I mean? Like we, we think people should do things, or we have a business objective that says, marketers do this all the time, where they're like, I need to get these 20 pieces of information about a person before I can really do something with it. And it's like, OK, well, no one wants to give you that information, so let's find a different way of doing it. Um, I've had that argument like 50 times like a year. <laughs> um, but, but realizing that you can't get people to do what you want can open your eyes to what you can get them to do. So I want to talk about one last um, uh, company that I've worked with. There's a company in the States called, yes, yep, got it. Uh, there's a company in the States called Rent the Runway. And basically what it is is uh, Netflix for dresses. So women can rent dresses for dates or for um, uh, weddings or whatever. Any, any sort of event you can rent a nice dress for and look good. And then you don't have to buy it. You, know, you can just turn it and get a new one the next time, which is very useful. So we helped them launch their, their product in 2009. And it kind of worked with them straight from 2009 to 2016. This is their ho original homepage. The goal of this homepage is to tell people, we have uh, lots of things that come in all the time. We have brands you've heard of. Here are some reasons you might want to do this. That's all we need to do is get people, convince them that like, maybe this is a service you want to take advantage of. As soon as this project launched, the founders of this company were obsessed with one thing. And that one thing was, why are you renting a dress? We really want to know why you're renting it so that we can understand what dresses to put in front of you. Um, so within two months of launching it, we redesigned the homepage to be about kind of getting you to kind of get into that renting process and tell us why. There's a drop down there that says occasion. And so what people would do is they would come here and the goal was you're going to tell us when, you're going to tell us where you are and, we're going to sh and what, why you're going and we're going to ship, show you dresses that are right for you. Well, people came to this page quite a bit. And what they did was they went over here and clicked on dresses, because they wanted to see all the dresses that were available to them, no matter where they lived or what they were going for. And this really, really kind of frustrated the founders of this company. And they were like, we just want to know why they're renting it. So we re redesigned this page like six more times, putting this form in different places, and people still just went to dresses. So then we redesigned it again and said, OK, look. Tell us what you're going for. Is it a wedding? Is it a date? Like, we just want to know why you're going here. And I'll tell you a little secret. You know what happened is people came to this page and they clicked on dresses <laughs> because they, wa they wanted to know what, what, what was available to them. So the, the thing was that like, what's right for a dress, what's the right dress for, for a wedding for you is going to be different than it is for you or you. And so I don't want you to tell me what dresses I should wear. I want to choose it myself and then you know, and go from there. So finally, yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, they're, they're a customer service company. They want they want you to ask them those questions. Absolutely. So eventually, what here's something that happened is that they're in a meeting once, and they're looking at all these this customer feedback they're getting. They're getting email after email after email with people who rented dresses and they're like, oh my god, I rented this dress. It was so perfect for this wedding I went to. Thank you so much. Here's a picture of me in the dress, and they got all these pictures of people in dresses, and someone was like you know it would be interesting, what if we put them on our blog? So they put them on the blog, and people start reading the blog, and they're like, where can I get that dress? Because they didn't link to the dress page. You should talk to Billboard about that. Um, and, and, uh, but then one day, they were like, OK, we'll add some links. But what if we put that picture of that person in the dress, instead on the, on the blog, on the actual dress page? People were like, wait, what? The, the, the models are on the dress page. We can't do that. And they're like, oh, well, we could try. So, they did an experiment where they put some pictures on, on a page with the models. 
and they put some picture, they put some uh, pages without the pictures on them. And the pictures without with the regular people had a lift of 75% with addresses that rented. So they're like, oh, people really want this. So this changed their business, like literally changed their business almost overnight. So they created a whole new section of the site called Our Runway, which is like you could go and not just look at dresses on like or look at dresses in real people on the dress page. You could just search by real people. You could go to that page and you could search by body type, by um, uh, if you had bus size, waist size, whatever. So you could look at people who are only like you in that dress. So you would feel, you know, like this will look good on me. And in the end, this, this, like their whole business is now about that and about getting you things that are right for you. Um, and that just, just by listening to those people who, who finally emailed them, as opposed to thinking that like, we need to ask the user, we need to get this from the user, as opposed to you know, the users want to tell us this. So they've gone a little bit more minimal now uh, on, their, on their homepage. Anyways, that was the last story. Um, we do have some time for questions and answers, about seven minutes if anyone has any more questions or answers. I'd like some answers, yeah. So it depends on the feedback we're looking for. So if it's customers, the way we do it is we look for trends. So if we see that like, you know, 80% of people are complaining about this thing or are saying good things about this thing, um, then it's something that we need to think about how, how would we fix it. Um, now the follow up to that might be, oh, the, the, the solution here is obvious, we just need to do this. Or it might be to the conversation earlier, like, okay, why aren't, like, like they're frustrated about this experience, let's look at the analytics, let's do some testing, and then let's, let's, let's figure out what the solution is. For client feedback, it's a little bit different. Um, the way we do it with our clients, especially if it's a, like a group of people, is we assign one person to be the point of contact. We say, look, you guys go back, have a conversation, because you guys might disagree about something. And I don't want to sit there and listen to this guy say one thing and this guy say something else, because I'm, like, I'm not the arbitrator there. You know? But if you guys can figure it out, great. If there is something you disagree on, we can weigh in based on our experience and our recommendation, but I don't want to sit there in the middle of an argument. So figure it out first. And that way, you know, we give them like 24 hours, 48 hours to do that, but generally that works pretty well. Um, and then once they give us the feedback, you know, we're like, well, you're wrong. No. Um, we're like, okay, here's what makes sense. Here's what we're going to address. Here's where we disagree. And where we disagree, let's have a conversation about that and figure out either, either we have to do it because it just has to be done for the business, or is there a better solution? Or why are, you, why are you thinking about it this way? Let's understand that and figure out maybe a better solution that we can all live with. I wouldn't say which feedback is more important. I think which feedback they all agree upon. Um, when it comes to prioritizing it, that depends. The way we do that is, is, how, is this, how will this feedback affect the timeline? So if it's like this thing is going to change a whole lot of things and push this out by weeks, do you want us to prioritize that or do you want us to focus on this? And you know, if they want us to, they can do that, but if they don't, we'll put it over here for later and then work on the, that other stuff. Any other questions? Yeah. I know this question is primarily about um, giving feedback. Yeah. Do you have advice for people on how to um, receive and deal with bad feedback? You know, the example you gave, I don't see any how do you go about uh, getting the good information out of people when they say things like, I don't know how to do it? Right, that's a good question. Um, so the way that I, I approach this now is um, I start by asking why questions. Um, because I think asking questions are a little bit more open-ended, you start to have a conversation. And so if you said to me like, Dan, I really liked your presentation, but I didn't like the fact that you used blue in that, in that thanks, I'd be like, okay, Bill, well, is it, is the is the blue bothering you? Is it annoying you, or what? What is it about the blue that is kind of affecting you? Like, do you feel like it doesn't go with the colors? And you might be you might answer, you know, um, I think it's too bright. It's just it's just really glaring to me. And I'd be like, like oh, okay, so so it's not the color blue. It's just that it's a bright hue of blue. What if I tried something softer? You know, I'd be like, no, I just hate blue. <laughs> um, but I really try to make it a conversation, and and then you know, eventually that conversation leads to some sort of revelation. Usually, usually, um, unless someone's super like. Um, you know, angry about, about blue, which could happen, I suppose. Yeah. Any last questions? All right, great. Thank you guys so much for, for coming in and being part of this. I've just been.